Hello, I'm Leighton Flowers with Sociology 101 and Director of Apologetics for Texas Baptist. I want to um, talk about a question that I get quite often from other former Calvinists. Um, when someone writes a book or you know has a podcast on a particular subject where they went through something, it often uh, endears them to people who are going through the same thing. Um, and rightly so. I mean, if you've gone through a particular event um, or going through a particular event that you know someone maybe a little older or, you know, even the same age or even younger that's going through the same thing that uh, that you are going through, oftentimes you want their opinion. You want their advice. You want, hey, what, what, what do I do about this or how do I handle this situation? And so I get messages on a weekly basis from either former Calvinists who have been struggling in their own churches or who, uh, from listening to my podcast or, or reading my, my book, The Potter's Promise, um, have come to doubt and question their former Calvinistic beliefs um, and send me letters and either, you know, thanking me or <laughs> even expressing maybe a little bit of uh, disdain for me because I have uh, rocked their uh, normal systematic way of thinking, um, proving by the way, I think there's free will because we do have the freedom to be influenced and persuaded by other people's arguments and ideas. Um, and I see that on a regular basis. I used to keep count of the number of Calvinists that wrote and said, thank you, I'm no longer a Calvinist or, you know, letting me know that they have left Calvinism. Uh, I got into the 30s and I lost count after that. So I, I know that um, when when people listen to the cast, people consider it openly, they are going to be persuaded, just like there are other people who are going to be persuaded to go the other direction. A lot, a lot of people, um, especially um, in my generation and younger, um, you know, per, were persuaded out of a kind of a namby-pamby, easy believism, no real, you know, s deep doctrines of sociology or predestination or election. And Calvinists were really good in the last 20 years or so to pr produce a lot of answers to those hard questions. And thus there was a resurging, I think, of Calvinism, especially among uh, Southern Baptist in the, the denomination I'm a part of. And I was one of those. But I think there's going to be a pendulum swing back the other direction where you're going to see a lot of us, um, like myself, who come to study the deeper, more robust alternatives besides just Wesleyan foresight faith view and come to a different understanding of Calvinism. So I think more and more over the next 20, 30 years or so, you're going to see this pendulum swing of a lot of former Calvinists, those who claim to be or hold to a tulip systematic, who no longer do so. And because of that, there's going to be some angst. There's going to be some disappointment. There's going to be some difficulty. Um, and one letter I just got this week um, kind of expresses that angst and that difficulty, and I wanted to read it to you. And then to answer this question the best I know how as to what, what should you do after you've recanted Calvinism, especially if you're in a ministry leadership position like a pastor. Um, quite a few professors and pastors uh, uh text and email me or um, message me um, on, on this subject just because this is the, the field I've, I've particularly studied in. And, and I hear a lot of great feedback from them as to how their students are responding to the podcast or to the book. And oftentimes they send um, some of these students my way or some of these pastors my way to say, hey, this guy might be able to help you through your transition because he went through a similar thing when he recanted Calvinism you know, back 10 years ago or so. Um, and so here's the letter that I um, that I posted on a Sociology 101 Facebook page, which if you haven't liked that page yet, please do so and follow me there, as well as um, our, our Twitter uh, site um, and uh, many other places you can follow us on social media. We encourage you to do that. Um, <clears throat> I have not released this pastor's name. I, I would love to. Matter of fact, I've invited him to come onto a podcast, and I hope he will in the future. He's not at the place where he can do that yet. Um, and you'll see kind of why he, he's done that. And so he, he's left his name anonymous. Um, and so let, let me read this to you. It says, Dr. Flowers, I have a bit of a bone to pick with you. You have put me in quite a quandary. I am a longtime pastor at a quote unquote Calvinistic Baptist church, and I have been a Calvinist most of my life. About a year ago, one of my church members, who is close with my wife, kept hounding her to listen to your podcast until finally she did. After a few months of listening to you, she became thoroughly convinced that Calvinism was wrong. She then began to insist, she, she then began insisting that I listen to your podcast with her. <laughs> I refused. I told her, you were deceiving her and that she should stop listening to you. We had many fights about this until finally she just stopped talking about it, which I found out later was advice you gave her. I had all but forgotten about it until my birthday came around. 
She gave me several gifts, one of which was your book, <laughs> The Potter's Promise. <laughs> Sneaky wife. <laughs> she, she promised me that if I would read your book with an open mind, then she would never bring this issue up again. I reluctantly agreed, so j- just to shut her up. <laughs> so, it's been really honest about this. Um, <clears throat> after I uh, finished reading your book last week, uh, this led me to binge on, binge. I guess binge, uh, you know, people binge on uh, Netflix. I guess you can binge on podcasts too. Um, to binge on your podcast over the last six days. Wow, you have completely messed up my world. I cannot believe that I'm even writing you this letter right now. I would have never dreamed that your book would have convinced me to recant Calvinism, but it has. I cannot believe I have not seen this before. I mean, I've questioned some of the typical issues people have against Calvinism, but I've always been quite certain the tulip soteriology was correct. I'm even more certain now that it isn't. So, what am I supposed to do now? Resign my church? Recant publicly? Go back and try to fix everyone I misguided over the last 16 years of my preaching ministry? See how you've put me in quite a quandary? Don't get me wrong, I'm eternally grateful for helping me to see this error, but I am quite perplexed as to what to do now. It's like I'm seeing the Bible in a whole new light, and I so badly want to start teaching my fellowship what I've been learning, but on the other hand, I don't want to split the church or cause division among the brethren. So I guess I'm writing for two reasons. One, to thank you for your work and influence in our lives, and also to ask you for your advice as to how I should proceed from here. Is this something you've seen before? What have others in my situation done? And could you even point me to them so I can talk about it with a brother who's been through this? Thank you for your time and your prayers. What, what a great letter. Um, and, and it's a, it's an honest struggle, and it is a hard struggle. And I, and I empathize with this, with this brother. And I, I want you to notice something here. Notice what he writes right here. He says, it's like I'm seeing the Bible in a whole new light, and I so badly want to start teaching my fellowship what I've been learning. You heard of Calvinists called a cage-stage Calvinism before? That, that's just kind of what they're experiencing when you become a Calvinist. Because when you come into a new belief, whether it's in Calvinism or out of it, when you come to understand something in a way you didn't understand it before, you become somewhat vehement about it. You become somewhat... You, you, it's like when you get that new product that you just ordered off of Amazon and maybe you, you got this new pen or this new computer or this new car or whatever it is. I don't know. You get this new item that you just absolutely, you love it and you want everybody to know about it. And so you're just talking about it all the time or your, your favorite football team won last night. So what do you do? You talk about it all the time. Well, you kind of have that um, reaction when you come to understand a certain doctrinal theological point of view for the first time. And so cage stage Calvinism is kind of some, some guys coming to understand something they didn't understand before. And they think they, they kind of feel hurt that they were never taught these quote unquote doctrines of grace, these, this tulip systematic before. And so they become very loud about this system. They almost become evangelist for the system itself because they want as many people to know about this, this newfound truth that they've come across. Well, the same thing can happen coming back out of Calvinism, where you you find this newfound truth and you just want to kind of, oh, guys, I've, I've realized where I'm is mistaken, and here's where it is. And, and you want people to understand in the same way that you've understood the, the scriptures. That's just human nature. That's the way we are. We want people to see and to understand the things that we see and understand and that we've learned to value and that we love. We want others to experience that same thing that we've got to experience. And we can even get a little bit upset with them when they don't. We're like, don't you see this? Don't you don't you see it the way I do? And it can become even contentious because they don't see it the way you do. And so in the same way that I would warn those who are coming into Calvinism, and I think I've heard John Piper and other good notable Calvinists warn young Calvinists to be careful of this cage stage, I, I would say the same thing for those who are coming out of Calvinism to be weary of and wary of the, the cage stage um, transition of coming into a new understanding or a new way of thinking doctrinally, and to be careful and wise as to how you approach your differences of opinion. Especially, and I would say this to the pastor, I don't know the details yet, I haven't heard back from you on some of the questions I sent um, via Facebook yet, but <clears throat> one of the questions I asked this brother was, is your church you know, reformed in, as far as its statement of faith? 
Is it, did they hire you knowing you were Calvinistic and expecting you to be a Calvinist, or is it just kind of leaning Calvinistically and half for Calvinist and half aren't, and some people don't even know what it is? Um, that that really makes a difference, I think, in how you might handle the transition here, because it very well be could be that you have quite a few people within your church, especially if this person within your church was influencing your wife to to come and listen to my podcast. There may be a good number of people within your church who aren't as Calvinistic as you might think they are. Um, and that if if you begin to be very open and honest with maybe your personnel committee or maybe your deacons or those who are considered leaders within your church and just kind of tell them the development of things that you've been learning and just be really upfront and honest about those things. Um, I would say the same thing for those who are Calvinists. Um, I, I've seen this happen all too often here in the state of Texas as a consultant. When, when churches call and the, their churches are going through a split and the churches are being split because— a pastor or a youth pastor goes into a church not fully disclosing their theological beliefs on this issue, maybe even hiding them to some degree, um, and then only uh, revealing them or uh, bringing them up later um, uh, to cause some division within the church. You, you don't want to do that on either side. It's never uh, wise or biblical to be divisive with any doctrine. Like we've talked about before, the true definition of heresy is one who's striving to divide the church versus one who's striving to, to unite the church and to keep the church on its its focus and its path. Um, I've known of churches. Um, I know where Austin Fisher right now, the author of The Young, Restless, and No Longer Reformed, who's a former Calvinist, who actually still works at the church that he's been at before, and uh, his pastor is Calvinistic, and he's not. And they get along fine. They're able to preach and teach at the same church. Um, that's a rare thing, maybe, but um, it, it is possible. Um, and it is possible that if, if you don't make this into a contentious issue, or you don't, again, try to shove things down other people's throat, but instead you just teach the Bible as honestly and as carefully as you can, um, you you present verses and passages, and maybe you present it from both perspectives for a while and just say, you know, I, I've been really struggling with these two perspectives, and I, I used to hold to this one, but now I'm leaning towards this one. And here are the two perspectives according to these two or three scholars and, and present it more like a professor would as a teacher versus dogmatically saying this is right and this one's wrong. Um, you, can pre- you can present both and then express why you um, are leaning towards one versus the other, but then express, as I oftentimes do when I'm teaching on this subject, but if you don't agree with me, that's perfectly fine. We can still worship and, and celebrate together, and um, you probably can go a whole uh, year without ever hearing me actually bring this particular doctrine up all that often. So you know, it's not, it's not something you have to major on within your local church that it becomes a, a divisive issue or a splitting point. Um, but um, that it can be more of a side issue or something that you handle in, in smaller Bible studies and, and more in-depth Bible studies where you go deeper for those who are really interested in going deeper. And, um, and if you find, obviously, that it just it cannot work where the church is very Reformed. I mean, it's, it's known to be a, a Calvinistic Reformed Baptist church. It was founded on the premise. Um, then I think you'll have to do kind of like what I did at the church that I was at. I was at a uh, Cornerstone Baptist Church there in Wiley. It was a Reformed church that actually split off my home church, First Baptist Church of Wiley, back when I was uh, coming out of high school into college. I mean, coming out of college, graduating from college, I was going there as, a, as an intern, and um, I was Calvinistic coming out of college, and the church was not, and it was actually uh, there was some contention in the church over this issue, and so I had to talk, talk to my pastor and I told him what I believed, and I ended up not serving in my role there, and I, and I, you know, I as a as a Calvinist, I. Uh, volunteered to leave that church so as not to be contentious. I was very honest with my pastor, and I told him what was happening and what I believed, and he and he didn't feel that it would be good for me to serve in a teaching role. And so I I backed out without any you know any contention. I ended up going to that other church, um, that Calvinistic church in the area, and, and serving there for a while. And this is condensing about ten years into a couple of seconds here, but um, years later, um, that's when I came out of Calvinism. About ten years later. And I was still serving at that church when I was coming out of Calvinism. And so I went to the, the elder board of that church, um, and I just told them my doubts and some of the things I was really struggling with. I was still in the midst of coming out of it. I hadn't totally recanted. I was just struggling with it, and I wanted to be really honest with them, and I told them. And I, and I uh, resigned to that position. It was at the same time that I was being offered and courted by Texas Baptist to come on as the director of youth evangelism. And so um, it was a easier transition for me because I did have a place to go from there. 
and um, I ended up leaving that church to to come to Texas Baptist while I was kind of transitioning out of Calvinism. And I was still very, um, <clears throat> I was still very mindful and very, uh, you know, comfortable with Calvinism at that time, and even okay with a lot of what Calvinism claimed. But at the same time, I was starting to doubt certain key um, components of it at that time. All that to say is that I, I really think open communication, being very forthright and honest about things, not treating it as if it's the end of the world to have disagreements with each other. It's just not. It doesn't have to be overly contentious. Um, because of sometimes the focus on online social media stuff and you see all the demon pictures of this, this, and this, and this cult-like group and one side painting the others in the worst lights possible, and it just it makes it so much worse than it it needs to be, in my estimation, um, because for the most part, it, a lot of the differences are really more philosophical in nature and how you contend with um, certain aspects of God's divine nature in its in His relationship to the the finite world. And so, <clears throat> the 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 fact that most you know uh, theologians can uh, to some degree come to a point of of agreement on a lot of the issues and a lot of the things that really matter. I don't think it's necessary for for uh, this to become a splitting point or dividing point. But it's also not something I would say that you should keep secret or that you should try to hide from people either. I think if you're recanting a particular sociological worldview, I think you should be honest with the people you're with. Express to them humility by uh, telling them your struggles, telling them where you felt like you maybe messed up in the past. And that you're still ever learning. You're still always striving to become a better student of the gospel, a student of the word, and and that you're and that you as a pastor, as a teacher, are going to continue to be open for God to teach you today what He wants you to know about His truth and about His character. And so that that's just what a pastor. You're leading by example. You're 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 telling them, hey, I want you to be open to what God may be teaching you that wasn't necessarily taught to you as a child. And so, too, I, even as an adult pastor, must be willing to listen to what God may be teaching me. Um, that there are alternatives um, sociologically between different worldviews. And I was only presented um, the Wesleyan Arminian and the Calvinistic worldview, and I sided with Calvinists for a long time. And now I'm familiar with this traditionalist perspective, this more robust view of the corporate view of election. I understand now how Romans 9 could be taken in a different light. And so I've come to a different conclusion, and this is why. Um, be able to defend why you believe what you believe. Give answers to the hard questions. Uh, grapple with it for a while, maybe before going to the church to make sure you, you know where you stand and you have solid footing as to how to answer some of those hard, uh, more difficult questions. So hopefully that's been helpful. I know some of you are struggling. Um, you know, I say a prayer for you. I know it's hard. It, it can become, become emotional, but hang in there. Um, God is with you, and he will help you to pers- persevere through those trials and those difficulties and learning more about who he is and expressing uh, what you've been learning to others. God bless you. Talk to you next time. Bye-bye.